Let's talk about news in the future. Please join me in welcoming Vivian Schiller, the CEO and President of NPR. Why leave the New York Times to come to NPR? The New York Times is one newspaper that really uh, seems to have had great success in finding its way in the digital age. Why leave uh, a safe, comfortable perch there to come face the challenges of NPR? Well, um... I left, just by way of background for those of you in the room, I, I, I was with the New York Times. I was the uh, general man- senior vice president and general manager of nytimes.com, the website, um, until January of 2009, so about a year and a half ago, when I um, joined NPR as president and CEO. And um, it was one of those classic situations where I absolutely did not want to leave. I had no intention of leave. I, uh, leaving, I, I imagined and could picture myself, you know, retiring as at, at the New York Times, which is an institution that I love. Um, but the op- this opportunity came along, and it may be, it may really have been the only position in all of journalism, I knew I would always stay in journalism, that was just too wonderful and too big an opportunity to pass up. Uh, you know, NPR, the, the amazing thing as someone that's been in commercial media, uh, I've been in commercial journalism and commercial media all my life until joining NPR. But the interesting thing is that with the massive disruptions that's happening in the news industry um, in the last few years, and even more so in the last two years, the, the tide has turned and in many ways the financial conditions and the way that people use media is now actually favoring both the business model and the way NPR delivers news than it is newspapers and other commercial institutions. So, you know, I saw the I saw what was an amazing opportunity to work with an already, as you can see, fantastic organization with amazing people, and maybe make it even bigger and stronger and and even better fulfill the the news and information needs of the American people and hopefully some of the people in Berlin as well. You say the conditions have improved and changed to do both traditional and, and digital media, but NPR's non, not-for-profit status certainly didn't protect us from the fiscal pain that hit That's right. just about every news right. organization. Just before you came, there were painful cuts and staff layoffs. Two shows were canceled. Uh, then after you came, you, you instituted uh, some more painful That's right. cuts that were yeah. needed. I guess, just briefly, are we out of the woods right. financially, or is there still a lot of... Uh, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't the world's greatest time to begin a new job, but right after there was a lot of layoffs and came in and go, hi, everybody, guess what? We have to do more. Um, that, was, that was not very pleasant for, obviously, for me, let alone um, the people in the organization and the people, unfortunately, who, who a handful of people who did lose their jobs and others that had to make sacrifices. Everybody at NPR, NPR has made, been making sacrifices over these last two years in the form of um, wage freezes and furlough days and other um, and other um, hopefully temporary reductions. Uh, but as much as we did suffer some losses, uh, we, are, we didn't suffer the kind of devastating, devastating permanent losses uh, that many newspapers and many broadcast entities are. And um, I, there's a number of reasons for that. Number one, um, just purely on a business model, from a business model point of view, we have about five or six different revenue sources. And most newspapers and other organizations really only have two, so, and both of which are in you know, permanent uh, secular decline. With our multiple revenue sources, we stay fairly balanced. We did get hurt very badly in corporate underwriting, which went down quite substantially, hence the cuts. But that's coming back up, and the rest of it stayed pretty stable. But the other reason I think that we are in, in many ways better positioned is um, two other reasons. One, our audience, strangely enough, in the last 10 years, as the audience for you know, mainstream media, the, M- the so-called MSM of the United States has declined, newspaper audiences have declined, broadcast uh, news audience have declined double digits, NPR stations have seen audience growth of almost 60%, 6-0, in the last 10 years. In fact, we just had another record ratings period in the United States uh, there are now almost 34 million people who tune into an NPR member station every week, and they listen on average six hours a week. So we have a tremendous audience. We have a stable um, sources of revenue, and um, we have a very unique system of a national organization in NPR and um, locally owned and operated stations in every community in America. And I think that gives us a lot of stability and a lot of opportunity for growth. Beyond the finances, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, 
from a substantive news perspective. I mean, do you worry at all in this internet age uh, with blogging and microblogging? Do you, do you worry at all that it's putting more pressure on mainstream journalists to, to be more opinionated, to have more of an attitude, potentially uh, dumb it down? There, there's still an obsession with sort of being first that sometimes is warranted, other times seems completely irrational and who tweeted it first, et cetera. Right, Do you right. think that, that there's a, there's <laughs> yeah. a risk there, that yeah. journalists are being pushed down a road uh, Yeah, it's not, not good for the business? There, there's no question there are risks. Um, but to me, the opportunity that, that the Internet, and particularly social media presents, if we're smart about it, so far outweigh the risks that it's just, it's just a, a, a it, there's just no question in my mind. You know, at, at NPR, we, we are not, we've never been in the game of, of, of breaking a news story five seconds before somebody else. You know, if a plane crash and we haven't got the sources uh, immediately for it and somebody else reporters it, you know, 10 minutes before we do, fine. I mean, we don't, we don't measure our journalistic success in a matter of seconds or minutes with those kind of stories. Um, we do the stories that we like to break are the investigative stories that our reporters do the enterprise work on are the only ones on the story. Just in the last week, we've broken several stories about um, misconduct in the West Virginia mines where so many miners died just a few months ago, but by way of example. Um, but coming back to social media, look, there's always there's always a danger. There's always a risk. And, and if you follow um, the media at all, you'll know there have been several high-profile cases in just the last few months where journalists have either been, um, have lost their jobs or otherwise gotten, <laughs> gotten in trouble in the court of public opinion for saying something unwise in a tweet or on a Facebook post or what have you. But the fact is, these are wonderful tools. These are wonderful ways to engage with the audience, so long as you don't forget that you're still a journalist. And even if you're using a more casual voice, and even if you're using something like Twitter, you, you're still a journalist. Journalist, you still need to um, maintain your distance from an issue, not take sides, not make. You can you can blog um, incremental news reports. That's great, but you don't need to weigh in with what you personally think about it. And when you do that, when we it, by by being engaged with social media, it's fantastic. We just um, topped a million fans on uh, NPR's Facebook page, and the fact is. It's um, we have comment string streams underneath our stories that are fantastic. In fact, the it's very interesting because the comments on Facebook are actually even at a higher level than the comments on our website because there's no you can't hide your identity. You know, you can't use a fake name if you're on Facebook. You know, your identity is out there for everyone. And we engage and we get wonderful dialogue going and it it brings more people to our stories. So I love it. We just but yeah. We have to, we had to remind people just in the last week because of a couple of incidences to be careful what you tweet. <laughs> Wonderful tools, but be careful how you use them. Right. Do, you, do you see them as, as as icing as opposed to primary tools to deliver news and to and to uh, encourage discussion? More absolutely more than icing. I think that we. I mean, we're using Twitter not just you know uh, Twitter Twitter and Facebook and and all of the rest not just to publish our stories. I mean. A news organization that just sends out tweets saying, we have this story, that story, is really not taking advantage of what social media is. We do it to engage with the audience. We do it to, to, for news gathering. In fact, in the earthquake, well, two, two examples. In the, um, the uh, uh, 2008 presidential elections, and we'll do it again this fall for the midterms, we um, asked people to tweet from polling places where they, anyone that was having issues with their polling places, with voting, with access to voting, and we were able to uh, mash that up on a Google map to be able to capture, you know, using what is, you know, traditional, traditional crowdsourcing, that's sort of, I guess, a bit of an oxymoron, but using crowdsourcing to really tell a nationwide story. We did the same thing again um, in Haiti after the earthquake, because so many people in that country, even in poverty, had mobile phones. We were able to get the word out and get tweets back up um, and able to create and then in cooperation, we brought other news uh, organizations in to really map the country where the most damage was, where um, uh, resources were needed, where aid and help were needed, all using social media. So it's a way to tell stories and gather the news in a way that we've never been able to do before. The Haiti example is, uh, is a good one, uh, indeed. I, I'm wondering, though, some, some are worried that uh, an emphasis on social media blogging, microblogging, and, and the multiple platforms NPR is now on, uh, that it risks diluting the, the R in, in NPR. Radio, after all, in-depth quality uh, radio news is still what got us to the dance and built an audience of, of 34 right. million domestically and more 
internationally. It's what people rely on, all things considered, and, and Morning Edition have, have huge audiences. Um, is there a risk? Is there a fear? Uh, well, there, there's a risk if we don't if if we don't play our cards right. But look, radio is absolutely at the heart of what we do. That is um, that is what 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 most people at NPR came to NPR for. I mean, they care about journalists and they care about the very unique, irre- unreplicable form of storytelling that only radio can present. I came from working uh, many years in television, and I am. I am such a con- one of those really annoying converts. So I go around saying, "You won't be- really understanding for the first time how much more, frankly, powerful radio is than television." There's something about the intimacy of the sound of the voice, and oftentimes it's a solo experience that has a power that I really think is unmatched. And it is where our audience is. It is um, where our financial support is. It is where the bulk of everything that we do is. Um, but we would be unwise to not, let me back up and say, let me put it this way. At the end of the day, I feel like NPR's mission is to, is to provide for an informed American citizenry and to give people the information they need to, be, to, be, to participate in the democratic process and to be informed about issues and make form their own opinions. The primary vehicle we use to do that is radio. But if we really hold that as our mission, we should not limit ourselves to radio. We should be wherever our audience is. And to the extent that younger generations are using other forms of media, other forms of audio media, podcasting, 15 million downloads a month, or, or listening to um, radio on the Internet, which you will soon be able to do. Um, uh, by the way, NPR Berlin uh, on nprberlin.de, you will soon, by the end of the month, right, be able to have, yes, right, okay. August 2nd, you'll be able to stream um, the signal for those of you that are having a little trouble um, getting the radio signal, which I've heard a lot about uh, since I've been here. Um, Of course, you can also listen to any station um, in the United States um, streamed as well. But we also want to be, you know, powerful photographs, texts, blogs, interactive graphics. All of these are really powerful journalistic tools, and we want to make sure that we are reaching our audience in any way that they want to consume us. Does NPR have a responsibility um, to encourage greater dialogue on its on its sites and its related blogging and, and comment sections? Because all too often, sometimes, especially on hot button topics, uh, it's not really dialogue. It, it degenerates pretty quickly into name calling, spitball kind of stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with the story. I know when I covered the Arab-Israeli conflict. It was shocking and absurd to me to read some of the comments that would have absolutely nothing yeah. to do with the four-minute story I just did from Gaza. It would just be, you know, debating some arcane point of, of history and, and calling each other names. I'm just wondering uh, what, if anything, NPR can do to, to help encourage yeah. greater dialogue. Well, this is a, this is a you know a subject of great debate within all uh, journalistic circles, which is how do we keep that you know a civil discourse, not just a civil discourse, but an interesting dialogue going on in the comment section, you know, how do you keep, let, let those people in, but keep out people that just want to cause trouble. And, you know, there's, there's no perfect solution. At the New York Times, we had screeners some, that somebody read every post before it uh, went live, although we didn't take out, you know, we, we just, you know, checked for obscenities and something that was completely off subject. Uh, you know, uh, at NPR right now, we have a, you know, a, 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 a you can click if, if, if you feel like a message needs to be flagged for removal. We haven't found a perfect solution to it, but I, I am still, I'm an optimist by nature, and um, I'm very bullish about the possibilities and the opportunity with comments if we can get this filtering right. Part of it is to force, encourage, encourage and then for, or force people to use their real names where they can't hide behind anonymity. But I, I'll just give you one example of where, um, of, that just gives you an inkling of what the promise of a comment section is, what the promise of engaging with the audience is. So if you... Um, I don't know if what a big story, if it was a very big story here in Berlin, in Berlin, but about six, eight months ago, there was a story about this boy that was allegedly carried in a hot air balloon. Oh, God, you're not going to Balloon Boy, are you? I'm going to Balloon Boy. So does everybody know about the Balloon Boy story? I don't know if that was, okay. So the Balloon Boy story was a, a story that everyone was obsessed with in the United States for a period of six mm-hmm. hours, unfortunately. I mean, cable, news, you know, never mind what else was going on in the world. All there was was Balloon Boy. People were glued to their television sets. It's really not an NPR story. However, we have a blog on our website called The Two-Way, and midday, when a lot of people tune in, we 
thought, well, we need to tell people this thing is going on. So our blogger posted, look, balloon boy, the boy's in the balloon. We don't know the boy in the balloon. This is happening in Fort Hood, Colorado. You know, everybody's watching it on the television. Boom. Comment section. You're right. Most comment sections degenerate very quickly into all kinds of blather and people calling each other names. Um, in this case, the, the comment stream started from the first one and kept going, a dialogue between several people calculating the possibility of whether that boy was in the balloon. The first blogger comes in with some kind of um, calculus uh, equation I don't even begin to understand. That was like the weight of the balloon, the thickness of the, bi- the mylar, you know, the altitude at Fort Hood, you know, how big the boy is, the time of day, the lift, the Gulf Stream. The other one comes in and says, no, I think this one. They start arguing with each other. One of them says to the other one, show me your math. It was like, you know, this was the... <laughs> but, but, the but the amazing... NPR. Only NPR listeners. But by the the end of this, these in this comment stream, they figured out that the boy could not have been in the balloon before the balloon even landed. So, okay, silly story, but you know what? You think, wow, how do we capture that? Because we have so many smart people in the audience. So, that's why I'm hopeful. I didn't know something good came out of Balloon Boy. That's oh, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> small silver lining. <laughs> Turning to foreign news a little bit. NPR has 18 bureaus around the world including in some very difficult places, Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, Baghdad, uh, Gaza, Pakistan, uh, and other places. This is expensive. It's difficult. There's hope in the near future to expand it as well. But our 18 bureaus, you know, it's, it's nothing in some ways to gloat about because it also the wider industry is facing a, a kind of crisis in foreign news. Um, many organizations have cut back on the number of bureaus, the number of people actually on the ground reporting the news. I guess first question, I'm wondering if you think this crisis has an end point in terms of, of where do we turn around, where do, where do you pull out of it, and then we can talk a little bit about foreign coverage. The crisis in journalism? Yeah. And, well. And people not. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, th- this is, you know, we could spend the rest of the evening talking about sort of the changes that are happening in journalism and why, you know, here's the thing about foreign coverage. Foreign coverage has never been profitable. In newspapers, coming from newspapers, coming from television, no advertiser says, put me in the foreign section. Because all that war stuff, that's where I want my products to be seen. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in television. It doesn't happen in radio. But newspapers were able to protect their coverage of the stuff that advertisers weren't interested in, like foreign coverage, like investigative coverage for so long, because the product was bundled. And so when you have a bundled product, like like a newspaper, you know, the advertising that the advertisers that might come in for the business section or the travel section are subsidizing your Baghdad bureau. With the unbundling of news, which is what's happening with the Internet, all of the parts and pieces are being unbundled. All of a sudden, the, 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 the parts of the news business that really don't have advertiser appeal are sort of, you know, have a bright light shining on them as, you know, you know it, it, for, for cuts. And that's what's happened. And as a result, you know, here we are with NPR. Yeah, we have 18 bureaus, you know, which is great, not nearly enough. But, you know, we have more foreign bureaus than ABC News, NBC News, CBS News, Fox News. I mean, think about that. I mean, the great CBS, you know, Tiffany Network and News, NPR has more bureaus. I mean, I'm glad for us, but it's really sort of a sorry state of affairs. Um, I don't see commercial media really reinvesting more in foreign news. Certainly, you know, the AP is still there. Reuters is still there. We're British. But um, I, think, I think public media is, has the model that will allow us to expand. And so that's why we feel a great responsibility, you know, to, you know, that's why we're trying to figure out our business models to raise more money so we can um, have more foreign bureaus, more foreign reporting, more of the stuff that other news organizations are abandoning. I know when I lived in, in the Middle East, um, it was pretty much a, a monthly thing where I'd have to say goodbye to a, a friend or colleague who, whose bureau was closing down and he wasn't being replaced. I mean, he's literally shut the door, turn in the lease, no. turn in the key, go home. And these were major newspapers and, and still are that, that walked away from foreign coverage, at least directly with their own bureaus. We're talking the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Baltimore Sun, uh, the Boston Globe, good friends of mine. You know, I joked with them, are, are you going to change the name to the Boston Local now that you don't have uh, foreign bureaus? Still called the Globe, I believe. But, I mean, <laughs> they just walked away. So yeah. it's interesting to see what, what will come and fill the void. NPR is doing some of it. But as you noted, 
television networks aren't stepping up as much as maybe they could right. or should. Well, we, I, I don't know the answer. I wish I, I wish I knew the answer to that. There are some promising new organizations that are trying to figure out I mean, it's really, it's, it's all about the money. So it's really the not-for-profits or the other, other new kinds of business models, online business models, that might find a way to provide more foreign coverage, at least foreign coverage from American news organizations. Of course, there are news organizations all over the world that cover the world, but I'm speaking about news organizations that are, that are uh, giving an American perspective to the foreign coverage or making it relevant to American audiences. There's a, there's a, new, a, a, a news organization called Global Post that's pretty nascent um, out of Boston. They have a burgeoning business model that's sort of quasi not for profit. Um, you know, so they've got a, a, a network of, of, of stringers all over the world. I don't know. There's a lot of experimentation going on in media right now. I do believe that new models will emerge out of, you know, all of these multiple revenue sources that we are, so many news organizations are examining. And hopefully that will bring some support to foreign coverage. I don't think foreign coverage will be the first to come back, though. It, the other problem in the United States is local coverage, state coverage of local and state government is is in a catastrophic condition. And as I understand it, 15 to 20 percent of all online users to NPR.org are, are from um, from overseas, yeah. which is impressive. It shows there's obviously a, yeah. an audience out, out there. I, I'm wondering in the foreign, you say the model has, has yet to emerge really of, of how to all do this, but with the new investigative unit, NPR has done some collaborations with other organizations. Yes. Do you see that expanding, whether it's the yes. investigative unit, whether it's foreign coverage, uh, in this age of austerity, are, are we going to be forced to or want to both uh, do more collaboration? Absolutely. We have to. You know, news organizations traditionally have, are ter have been terrible partners to each other. <laughs> you, know, there's a, you know, if you've ever worked in a newsroom, there's a certain, you know, arrogance, pride of arrogance about, you know, uh, among um, the, the best journalists, of course, not you, Eric, of course, you're not the least, but arrogant in any way. <laughs> um, but uh, that makes it sometimes difficult for news organizations or newsrooms to collaborate. But this is changing. I mean, that's been true. When I, even when I got to NPR a year and a half ago, I was told with, with a little tinge of pride, well, we don't partner very well. Well, we need to start partnering very well. And, and we have been partnering very well. And our investigative unit is a very good example, working with news organizations in the United States, other not-for-profits like uh, ProPublica and uh, Center for Public Integrity, Center for Investigative Reporting. We have not been doing too much. Uh, we do some partnership with the BBC. We have not been partnering very much with news organizations outside the United States. But I can certainly see that changing. And it's something that we need to look at. In fact, our strategy our, our, our strategy outside the United States has been largely focused on covering the world for American listeners. But with, you know, in the last few years, especially now with our, you know, our, this presence in Berlin that we're so incredibly proud of and so thrilled about, I cannot tell you, that's why I'm here. I've been waiting since I joined NPR to get over the financial crisis or, or set things a little bit on track so I could come to Berlin and, and experience what NPR Berlin is about and experience Berlin. But we're you know, beginning to see what are the opportunities to bring NPR to more places in the world. And I know Kingsley, will, my colleague, will talk about, a little bit about more of that in a few minutes. I think it's a good time to bring up okay. uh, Kingsley Smith. He's the director of NPR Worldwide and NPR Berlin. And you can talk a little bit about yeah. NPR Berlin, and then uh, we can, can take uh, your questions as well. Kingsley Smith. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, anything in particular you'd like me to cover or just uh, review some of the latest developments? That well, as we know, some people have had problems getting 1041 in Berlin, depending on where you live. I live in Mitte, and it can be, well, depends on what room I'm in. So I'm wondering, uh, Kingsley, how are you going to solve my problem? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question, Eric, because one of the ways we're going to solve the problem is by offering online streaming through nprberlin.de. The issue with FM frequencies uh, and frequencies that are weak, it's not unique to NPR Berlin. It's a universal problem because of the way the frequencies are assigned. We happen to have been assigned a frequency that is not allowed to increase the power output substantially. We've investigated with our engineering firm how we could go about either moving the antenna higher, increasing the power, 
or doing um, other things, like even moving the tower, but because of the cost involved and the lack of available frequencies that would allow us to broadcast at a higher power, we're not really able to do that right now. So I think by offering online streaming uh, at nprberlin.de, it'll give folks who are not be able to get the signal very strongly uh, an opportunity to get it nice and clear. I actually was listening to it today. Uh, it won't be available to you until August 2nd, but obviously we've had to have a testing phase. and We've had testers uh, in Taiwan and other places that uh, have been able to verify for us that it works. And it works quite well, and I think you'll be very pleased with it. What, what are some of the pressing issues for NPR right at this moment? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, sev several fold. You know, one, the, the main thing is that um, in the United States right now, there is, uh, the, the news industry is in, in tremendous disruption. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many journalist jobs being lost at newspapers and broadcast operations. And as a result, at NPR, we feel a responsibility to sort of step up and uh, do more reporting where others are stepping away. So the pressure for us is how do we fund that? How do we deliver it? Um, who do we partner with? How do we work with our stations to make sure that news is being delivered at the local level? And um, so those are the kinds of things I'm mostly thinking about every day. Journalism is about providing news and information, eyewitness accounts, working sources, bearing witness, um, doing your research and delivering the news and presenting it to people so that they can form their own opinions and decide how to think and what to think. So uh, the tradition of the Edward R. Murrow, uh, and to call out um, falsehoods when they see it, to fall out, call out hypocrisy when they see it, but not take a point of view on any particular issue. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Edward R. Murrow, Walter Cronkite certainly fit that mold. Uh, the Glenn Becks and the um, Bill O'Reilly's, they come to their broadcast with a point of view. That's fine. They're, they're perfectly... Um, you know, free to present their point of view, but it's not journalism. It's it's presenting a point of view about issues in the news. That's not what we do at NPR. Mm -hmm. When injustice is happening anywhere in the world, it's the responsibility of journalists to report it. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely what we do. Mm -hmm. That's different than saying, um, talking about a political point of view or taking a side on a particular issue. Um, but when when we're dealing with erroneous information, when we're dealing with the, um, the uh, people that are being persecuted, of course, that's our journalist's job, is to present that information. You know, the famous saying to uh, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Mm -hmm. That is the role of a journalist. One more yeah. word, peace. Peace. Well, it's something we all hope for, but it's not a reality in the world today. So whether there's peace, whether there's war, we'll report on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.